Hi, I'm Holly Bradshaw, British record holder, Olympic medalist in the pole vault. Welcome to Athlete Mondio podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Athlete Mondio podcast. Athlete Mondio is French for athletes of the world. In this podcast, I interview track and field athletes from all around the world in their native language when I speak it. My guest today is Holly Bradshaw, the British record holder in the pole vault. Holly won a bronze medal at the Tokyo Olympics. In our conversation, Holly told me about the challenge of being so good so young and about her love for sports psychology. She also opened up about the post-Olympic blues she experienced after the Rio Olympics and about her fight for women's right to wear what they want when competing. You're listening to the original interview in English, but the interview is also available dubbed in French for those of you who understand French better than English. Enjoy! Hi, Holly. Welcome to the podcast. What do you think 10-year-old Holly would think of the woman you've become? Um, I think proud. Like, um, I was a very shy child, um, would kind of tremble at the the thought of, like, speaking in front of a class in English. I would like, refuse to, uh, I would hate reading. Just, you know, everyone takes a page of reading. I would hate that. And I think athletics has just given me a lot of confidence, um, I'm able to, you know, talk out about things I never thought I could have. And I think as I've grown through the years of being an athlete, I've found a higher confidence where I can actually talk about issues that I faced in the past to try and be a bit of an inspiration or try and help other athletes that might be going through the same thing. So I think, yeah, very proud at the kind of woman that I've become, I guess. Mm -hmm. We'll touch on these things later in the podcast, but I wanted to ask you about your the beginning of your career because you were very good, very young. Do you sometimes feel it was your progression was too fast because you competed in London at the Home Olympics just a few years into your career? Was it too, too early? Yeah, I think so. I think when I reflect back on it, it was it all because I was one of these kids that could just take to any sport as soon as I found pole vault it came quite naturally to me and came quite easy um and I I think the first four years yeah were just a massive trajectory where I was breaking pbs every every week um yeah I was I was at the the world juniors then at the European under 23s winning medals and then finally at my home olympics and it was great at the time but I think looking back on it I wasn't educated around the sport um in terms of physical mental and everything and I think then the four or five years in the middle of my career where I struggled with a lot of injuries I struggled with a lot of mental problems I feel like I wasn't quite equipped for that quick trajectory um and it and it I think looking back if I could change anything I'd just have a few more mentors you know coaches that supported me and kind of not ex not um abusing my talent um I'd rather learn a bit more about the event a bit more about the sport take things a bit slower because I think that would have stood me in good stead but yeah I think it was it was hard that I you know I've jumped 487 in 2012 but I'd only been in the sport for like four years and then it took another nine years to break my PB I think the problem was I jumped that big height and didn't have a clue how I did it I was just rocking up to competitions And, and it was good in a sense because I just loved it. I didn't know what I was doing. I'd just rock up and compete. But actually, there's a lot more to elite sport. And I think it did a little bit of damage in me thinking, well, this is easy. I'm just going to carry on going like this for the rest of my career. And when it didn't, it was a bit of a rude awakening. When you when you started pole vaulting, did you have anyone to look up to? Anyone maybe to ask for advice? Because there were very few women pole vaulting back then. Yeah, definitely. And I think that era where I started, there was a lot of um, kind of European women on the scene that didn't speak a lot of English. So you know, I know Anna Rogowska was a great, you know, um, role model. But again, she was Polish, so didn't speak a lot of English. And then you had the Russian athletes. So I think it was really difficult to like connect with some of them because of the language barrier. Um, I think one of the inspirations for me was Fabiana Muir. I think her husband, who was a coach, helped me at quite a few meets. Um, she was very warm, very open and almost saw me as like a young kid and helped me out a lot. So if there was anything in terms of that, it was her. But it was a very difficult time where none of us really got on. None of us really chatted. You kind of got out there. You did your thing and then came away, whereas it's very different now, where we all hang out, have breakfast, dinner, tea together, we're out there chatting, so the, the event has evolved a lot throughout my career, and I much prefer it now, but I do think it's because 
it was in its infancy and the European kind of scene was quite um, dominant. So a lot of yeah Germans and the language barrier was difficult. Yeah, um, watching you in Tokyo, it was obvious that you and Katie were both very happy for each other. And uh, yeah, it was beautiful to see. You've been to three Olympics now. Um, I saw you co-wrote a paper on the post-Olympic blues. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, so after Rio, I'd had a really um, troubling year with injuries. I had surgery in the March. So it was kind of a bit of a battle that year. I missed a lot of training. Um, I had quite a lot of setbacks. So to even be at the Olympics... It, there was a lot of kind of unknowns in the lead up to it as to whether I'd even be there. But but to get there, I was, I was really, really happy. And then to finish fifth in the final, knowing how much I'd missed, it gave me a lot of hope and gave me a lot of um, promise. And I, I was just really happy. And on returning from those games, there was a lot of negativity and a lot of, oh, she'd finish fifth again or she missed out on a medal again. And for me, it was really upsetting because in the context of things, I mean, anyway, finishing fifth at the Olympics is incredible. but in the context you know I was really chuffed with that and it kind of made me feel really sad and I suffered some post-Olympic blues off the back of that and I remember doing um, an interview with a woman who was doing some other research and she found it kind of fascinating and we we got talking and we decided we were gonna co-write a paper together because we wanted to learn more about this kind of phenomenon and we we established that most athletes get it whether they had success and failure and I think For me, I just wanted to write this paper, raise awareness so that someone younger, maybe like 18, 19, going to the Olympics would would know what the post-Olympic blues is and it would potentially help them. It was something that inspired me to try and help other people. So what was the most important finding? Yeah, the, the important findings were that everyone suffered with the blues and everyone said there was not enough support after the games. They felt very supported before, you know, everything was thrown at them, psychology support, care, they kind of felt like a celebrity and felt really wanted. But then the minute the Olympics was over, it was like, everyone checked out, there was no support from the governing body, there was no support from like the media, it kind of all went and athletes really, really suffered with, you know, depression. Some people, it took them years to get over their Olympics. And I think it just highlighted a real need for support in that phase after and just help from someone which I think um, because of that there was something implemented for Tokyo which um, was really good. And is there a difference between athletes who had success at the Olympics and those who didn't? No it, even Olympic champions who won multiple medals came home and felt lost they felt um, like there was a gap in their life and I actually experienced that after Tokyo. Um, I had the massive high of finally winning the Olympic medal and then came home and just felt really like lost and demotivated for ages and Did I want to carry on with this? And it doesn't matter, matter whether you success or you have success, failure, or even somewhere in the middle. A lot of athletes really do suffer with the post Olympic blues. But does success really make athletes happy? Because when athletes train really hard to reach a goal, when when they reach it in the best case scenario, are they really happier, or do they feel empty and then need another goal? Yeah, that's a very good point, and I think that's like something that I felt. Um, And it's, and it's only short lived. And I think it's quite irrational. But I'd worked for 10 years, uh, 12 years of my career for an Olympic medal, and I finally did it. And it was amazing, an amazing time. And it's it, I reflect back on it so fondly. But there is a moment where you think, oh, I did it. And it doesn't feel any different. I think you're expecting something different to, to happen. And it doesn't. And I think For me, I'm very intrinsically motivated, so um, it was easier for me to actually enjoy the moment. But a lot of athletes who are outcome driven and gold is only what they want and they achieve it, they feel very lost and they feel like, oh, this is such an anticlimax. And I think trying to change some of the athlete mentalities in trying to be intrinsically driven from you know inside on other other factors other than winning and money and things like that can be really beneficial for athlete mental health. Mm -hmm. And I also heard you say in another podcast that after your bronze medal, some people told you, oh, my God, that was so close, like, like a bronze medal was not good enough. Yeah, I was outside a British supermarket and someone said to me, oh, well done on your bronze, but you didn't just quite do it. And that for me is just everything that's wrong with like society, the media, you know, just yeah. getting to an Olympic game should be a fabulous thing. But for me to win a bronze medal and then someone says, oh, it's not quite good enough, like almost only gold matters. Yeah, something like the mindset of people need to change. And I think a lot of that is driven by the media and, you know, a lot. A lot of medals are won by Team GB and you almost feel like you're ranked on that. So 
those guys that win a gold medal, but well, it's not quite as good as those that win three gold medals and mm-hmm. you're always ranked against someone else. And I think for me, what's missing is if I hadn't have won a medal and came fourth, but how incredible was that battle between me, Kat Stefanidi, Katie Najat and Sidorova? That should be celebrated just as much as the medals. And I think that is lost a lot in sport. Mm-hmm. And on the topic of like toxic reactions, I wanted to talk about what you uh, mentioned earlier, like what you had to go through early in your career when people thought it was okay to comment on your body and You said it made you stronger, but you don't have to answer if you don't want to. But I was wondering if how you feel with your body now, like has it had Im- a big impact or is it better now? Yeah, definitely. And I th- I definitely think it's going to impact me my whole life, if not like my whole career as an athlete. And I'm open to say that um, it's a lot better now. Um, there was times where I would obsess over my body weight I would like not you know look in a mirror but I found kind of ways around it like I still will really struggle to be like in a bikini in front of like other people so I just wear costumes or especially if I'm around other athletes I'll like just not go in the pool or I'll wear a costume I will not, not wear a bikini just because I'm kind of like scarred by that but I have learned to reduce those feelings a lot um it's been much much worse but I think I've kind of compartmentalized them with age but there's no getting away from I'll like struggle with this for like the rest of my life now which for me is a real real shame just because a couple of people wanted to comment um on social media which is something that I'm I like talking about a lot because I really want that to stop and I'd, I'd hate for like a 16 year old girl wanting to get into athletics to be put off or be scarred by um, comments that people make. Mm-hmm. And may I ask you if it ever triggered eating disorders? Um, never. I, I, I've never ha- suffered with an eating disorder. I would say I've like got disordered eating and like if I, you know, there used to be a time where I'd weigh myself every day and if I didn't see the body weight drop in, I would like really really reduce um portion sizes and like get head up about it you know only eat salad so I definitely I wouldn't go as far to say I've ever had an eating disorder thank thank goodness but definitely um like bouts of like disordered eating Mm -hmm. so knowing that a lot of young people especially young girls look up to you are you careful with what you post on social media yeah um I I always say it's like um, a privilege or an opportunity for for someone who's like in the limelight to be a role model. It's definitely not, It's it shouldn't be a given. Like if someone is a really good athlete or a really good singer and they um, are in the limelight, it's not a given that they should be a role model, but I think um, it's just a good opportunity and that's, what, that's how I see it and that's what I'm taking. Um, I like to put content out there that's realistic. It's very genuine. Whatever I put out there, it's 100% me. Um, I'm not making it up. That's what I do and that's what I think. And I and I just like to share messaging that potentially helps other people. Um, so yeah, I am, I'm, I'm very kind of conscious as to what I like post to make sure it's um, appropriate and kind of genuine, genuinely me. And, and that, that is something that's important to me. Mm-hmm. And you said earlier, you, you you don't want to wear certain, like a bikini or, but you were also outspoken about the, the disparities between what ma- male athlete, athletes have to wear and what female athletes have to wear. Uh, when did you feel like you had to speak up? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's been a couple of times where I've really had to compromise on what I want to wear. But at the Tokyo Olympics, when I went to the kitten out, there was just not an appropriate outfit for me to wear. Um, I definitely feel like with the rise of social media and with brands so interested in how many likes people get and there's no getting away from, you know, the t- how toxic social media can be. And and there's, there's no getting away from the, the, if you if you pose in a bikini or um less clothes more people are interested in that post which is fair enough but I am not like that I like to cover up um and I want to have options so it's fine for there to be options out there for women to wear less clothes if they want but that shouldn't hamper women that also do want to cover up and I feel like that's the way it's gone so when I went to the kitten out for Tokyo all the outfits were very skimpy you either had like um little knickers on showing your bum or you had to have your belly out and there wasn't um 
an appropriate option that I felt that I would feel comfortable in wearing because I'm, I'm a pole vaulter. I don't want to wear a vest. Like imagine I get up to the metal, metal stages and my vest knocks the bar off as I'm going over it. Like that's, that's just ridiculous. So I really pushed back and felt like it was appropriate for me to say, look, none of these are, are right. I want to, I, I want to have my bum and my legs covered up, but I also want my stomach covered up. And and to be fair, Adidas and Team GB were really good at uh, making me something. I wore the rowing outfit, which for me was perfect. But I think it just again highlights the need for more options for the um for the Commonwealth Games in England. They they made me a onesie, but it was um, a male onesie, so I had to send that off to my friend to get sewed because it was it was cut for a man. It was really long shorts, and again, I spoke to multiple athletes that have said they've asked for like. Um, a onesie or something that's more covering covering their body up and they just get get given men's kit and it's just in the in the society Mm -hmm. we're at today in the 21st century that's just not good enough um and that's not to say that women shouldn't be out there if they feel really confident and comfortable in a crop top and knickers that's good for them but a lot of women don't so we need to have the options at both scales yeah because you you need to be able to just focus on your jumps and not think, oh, there's a camera next to me and how do I look? And yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's been my philosophy. Um, you know, I don't wear makeup. Um, I, I don't really care. Like my hair slipped back. There's lots of photos of me in Tokyo where I'm sweating. I mean, it's humid out there. It's mm-hmm. hot. I'm working hard. And that shouldn't be seen as a negative thing. And the last thing I want to be worrying about is, oh, is, is my, is my, are my knickers riding up or, or, I'm 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 sitting down on my table the camera's there am I getting rolls on my stomach like I want to be focusing on I'm going to clear that bar and win a medal so you know I'm sure a lot of other women out there would be feeling the same so we need to have those um, options for them have you heard from other female athletes yeah yeah quite a few who have been in the same situation I mean uh, typically um athletes are in incredible shape and um, feel really really confident in their body so I don't think this issue has been raised maybe as much as it should but I have spoken to a few athletes who have said I've been in the same bow I've had to wear a t-shirt when I I, I, I would never throw in it or, or jump in a t-shirt but I've had to because that's the only thing I was given or I had to wear a men's outfit because that's all they had so there is mo- there is lots of athletes out there that struggle but it's just having the confidence and you know not not a lot of athletes want to speak out and and raise these issues because as soon as you open like that can of worms it can just be taken very literally or very dif- differently and I think a lot of athletes um don't want to speak out of the, as a fear of backlash but mm-hmm. I, I feel like it's appropriate for me to do so mm-hmm. and yeah and thank you for that because it's not just you um, can you tell us about your love for sports psychology yeah so I was always really skeptical about sports psychology I had a few like rubbish encounters when I was a young athlete where they just give you a questionnaire and you'd sit down and you'd fill this out. It was very robotic. And I was like, no, this isn't for me. And then I met my sports psychologist that I still work with now back in 2013. And it was like a breath of fresh air. We sat down, we talked. It was like I was sat down with my mum or my friend. We were just chatting. And I came away from that and I thought, we've just accomplished so much. And I didn't even realize we were talking about sports psychology. So it kind of opened my eyes to thinking, wow, this this is really good. And after about two or three years of working with her, I really ignited a passion for, wow, sports psychology can really make a difference. And it's there is a big stigma around it as to, right, you need to see a sports psychologist because you're psychologically weak and you, you've got a rubbish mind. But actually you can use sports psychology to help you get gain a performance advantage. And that's why I'm really passionate about promoting it to try and break down those stigmas of it only ever is used when there's a problem, because that's really not the case. And does your sports psychologist need to know a lot about ball vaulting to be able to help you? So it didn't, I mean, I don't think she'd ever heard of it or ever done it before when we met. Um, And she has learned a lot about it um, as we've gone along. But really, the principles of sports psychology can be very generic and and based on, you know, whether I'm a pole vaulter or a tennis player or whatever. The principles are very similar, but she has learned more about pole vault as as kind of we've worked together. But it's it's not it's not 100 percent necessary. But there is, you know, pole vault is quite unique in the fact that you know, you might run through or you, you might stumble across like fear blocks or whatever. So it's definitely important that she learn about that. Mm-hmm. And uh, how did you work together during uh, lockdown? Because I heard you say you did the visualization. Yeah. So what we did was 
um, every week when I would normally do a pole vault session, I would literally sit here in this room. My coach would be on the call and she would be on the call. And we'd basically all have our cameras off and I'd just hear her voice and I'd have to like close my eyes. And she would basically take me through the pole vault session. So she would introduce it like, she would say, you're walking into the high pack, the track's purple, you walk up to the pole vault pit, you put your bag down and basically narrate what I would normally do. And then when I get on the runway, Scott would then, my coach would come in and say, pick the pole up, you run four strides. And I basically, um, we did that for about half an hour, almost like I was doing a pole vault session. And it fa- I found it really, really beneficial. Um, I know Steve Backley, who was a javelin thrower, he said, he was injured for six months of his career and all he did was visualization and that was enough to almost stimulate his muscles to remember what he needed to do and I really felt like that's kind of what that period in in lockdown did. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Are there other things she helped you with? Things you struggled with before and no longer struggle with now? Yeah mainly like overcoming injuries and seeing them as a positive. Um, I've become a big um, ambassador for adversarial growth, which is you experience ad- adversity and you grow and become better from it. And she taught me how to do that. So anytime I get a knockback, um, I like bounce back better because of the mindset that I can create in myself. Um, she's also, I'm, I mean, I'm a very like mentally resilient person anyway. I think it's because I'm a little bit crazy and I probably got a bit of a screw loose, but um, she's never really needed to help me with any like run through issues. But I think one of the things that I have struggled with is like a loss in confidence because I had so much success early on in my career. It it ignited this. I almost like had a feeling I knew I could win a global medal, whether that was world or Olympic. I knew I was good enough, but because of the injuries and a lot of issues I faced with my body in the middle part of my career, I lost a lot of confidence as to, you know, maybe I'm just not good enough to do this. Maybe I can't win a medal. And she really like helped me stop that and stop those negative thoughts and 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 showed to me that I I can win a medal and I can keep going. And that was just a big turning point for me. And I think the biggest was tweaking my mindset. I was always very outcome driven. So my goals were, I want to win a medal at here. I want to jump five meters. I want to do this. I want to do that. Whereas she taught me to um, be more intrinsic. So instead of, you know, of course I want to win medals and I want to jump high, but that doesn't really matter because what I need to focus on is I need to be tall at takeoff and I need to come into the gym and clean this, or, you know, I need to eat well, you know, 30 days out of the month or whatever. And that for me being intrinsically driven and doing it for the love of it has helped me change my mindset and keep me in the sport. So I've been able to go on and get a success. So how do you know, what does it take for you to think you've had a successful season? Is it medals um, like the heights or is it other things? Um, it can be anything. Um, I think for me in 2021, I had the best year of my life and I jumped to PB. I um, got the Olympic medal, but on top of that, I was the most consistent I've ever been. I've had the most jumps ever over 480. Um, I was I was faster than I'd ever been. I was technically good. So it was all those things. But equally in 2021, 2022, sorry, you'd look at that and think, oh, worst year ever, which it was. But I learned a lot about my body. I got mentally more resilient. Um, It actually taught me that I still love the sport so much. I was motivated to carry on and go to Paris to win another medal. So actually, although 2022 looks like a disaster for me, it was very successful because although I didn't win medals and jump heights, I learned so much more about me as a person and it's given me so much more moving forward um, that it's almost equally as positive. I think I always try and promote that. When you have a good pole vault session or a good comp or whatever, you, it gives you an ego boost and you feel good about yourself and you're like, yeah, I feel good, but you don't learn anything because mm-hmm. it's gone so well. Whereas when you have a bad comp, a bad session, a bad time, it sucks. It really does. But you learn so much because you have to battle, you have to fight, you have to do so much to come out of that. And you learn so much and, and gain so many things that it's almost just just equally as positive. Mm-hmm. So how do you deal with bad training sessions? Do you ever beat yourself up? I used to I used to get upset after training sessions get really down physically like cry and be upset and beat up on myself whereas now I just try and find I make a list so if a bad comp or a bad training session what went well today and then the next column not the negatives but what can I do better so 
you know, in the in the what went well column, there might be one thing, but in the in the what we need to work on, it might be okay. Next session, I'm going to be taller at takeoff. I need to sleep better the day before. I need to eat better. Like whatever I can do to almost make it better, that's what I make a list of, and that kind of frames it as a positive thing. So instead of just sitting at home like I'm rubbish, I'm I'm never going to do well. Oh, I'm so upset. It's like okay, well, what am I going to do to change this? What make a list of what actions I'm going to do to move forward and then it almost becomes a positive because you, you're action in things rather than just feeling sorry for yourself. Is it something you write in your training diary? Yeah so I have like a training diary and I have a specific one for pole vault where I write down all my numbers like what pole I'm on what was my takeoff and things like that um, and then alongside that it might be you know I was really had a really good session was really tall at takeoff but next session I need to kick my leg faster and whatever so I'm always kind of writing notes to remind myself um I think as soon as you just rely on remembering it that's such a a bad thing I'm all for like get a notebook write it down reread it for the rest of the week um and just almost like study it Mm -hmm. and um, I'm a big advocate of that Mm -hmm. So you talked about uh, Scott earlier. I guess he was not your first coach. Can you tell us about different coaches you've had? Yeah, so I've had two coaches. Um, My first one got me started in pole vault. He was actually French. Mm -hmm. Um, He coached me from 2008 to 2012. um, And he was a really good coach. Um, I mean, he, he, he taught me all the basics um got me rolling i mean he, he helped me to jump 487 which is incredible the only thing was i didn't learn a lot about the sport i didn't learn a lot how to pole vault it was just take this pole run down plant it and you'll pop over a high bar whereas since i've been with scott he has made me like a student of the event so he taught me about training principles um he's taught me everything like statistically to do with the poll why we do that and I think that's been really important in helping me understand the event and then actually growing and becoming a better athlete Mm -hmm. I think I heard you say in a podcast that before you started training with Scott you didn't know anything about um, the flex and the length of the poles and you just talked about the poles using colors yeah exactly so my coach before would be like take the pink and green and take the blue and yellow which is one way of doing it and it really simplified it and it and it meant like I didn't overthink it I think it's really why I'm very headstrong now is because I don't associate the poles with anything I just take whatever and I trust my coach 100% but when I went to Scott he was like okay well what six step poles do you use and I'm like "Mm, the pink one (laughs) and he was like okay we need to not do that you need to learn about the poles you need to measure your grip you need to you know I didn't even do a um, a run rhythm count I just ran at the box whereas Scott was like no you need to count so like for eight steps I'll go one two three four one two three four and it kind of like plays in my mind the kind of rhythm and he you know I never did that before I just ran aimlessly at the box so I ha- I learned a lot about the intricacies of pole vault when I went to Scott. Doesn't mean that now you'd be able to have a competition without a coach? Yeah, um, my kind of philosophy on that is I could I could do a comp on my own. I'm very aware. I'm very aware of what I'm doing. Most of the time I'll come off the pit and I'll say to Scott, I was a bit close then and I, and I feel like he didn't jump at takeoff. And he's like, yeah, let's, you know, he agrees and we just kind of go like that. But for me, a lot of people always say, oh, you need to get better at um, going to a comp without your coach. But I never do that. And, I, and I'm never going to have to do that even especially a major champs so it's just something that I never need to do so we don't ever practice it or we we don't enforce it um that I definitely could but I like having him there it's my comfort blanket he if I'm in a stressful situation or it's not going well he's really good at just turning it around and calming me down um so although I could do it I I don't enjoy it Mm -hmm. okay what do you think should be done in a different way to better showcase Paul Bolton um I think we've got the possibility to do split screen now um and I think one of the things that makes Paul Vaught amazing is how it unfolds and the story it tells when you're watching a diamond league and you just watch every other jump nobody is interested in it because it, there's no context you just see someone clear or fail the bar and it's like okay whatever whereas only the real true pole vault fans that are maybe watching the card at home when one comes on the TV, they're like, oh, okay, this is Holly's attempt at this. Whereas Joe Bloggs, who's just tuning in because they like athletics, they can't take to the event because they don't understand. So I think split screen is incredibly important to, so someone can tune in and watch the whole comp. Um, Having more pole vault only comps with a live feed, 
I think is really good, um, especially like the ones in France where mm-hmm. you have two pole vault runways and there's one going each time. So it's constant action. I think they're really, really good for the event. Um, and I think just having having people like Mondo who are showcasing how incredible it is, is, is good for the sport because it just gets me p- people more interested in it. Will Paris be your final Olympics? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm going to retire after Paris. Um, so it's not like Olympics and done. I'll probably do competitions after that. But yeah, Paris will be my last major championships. It's almost home soil for you. Yes, it's the closest thing to home soil that you get yeah. being in Paris. All my family, they could easily drive over, mm-hmm. easily get a, you know, a 30 minute flight. So it's it's pretty much a home Olympics. So they're all coming and yeah, I'm, I'm excited that it's in Paris. Yeah, but it's interesting because I had this conversation with someone from Belgium and they were like, it's almost home soil, but it's not home soil. So it's not like going to Rio, Tokyo, because it's just France. It's just, yeah. you know, really close. But it's not home soil. So we don't get the support from the crowd. So it's just just bad. <laughs> We're not very happy about the Olympics being in Paris. Yeah, but you seem to find it quite positive. Yeah, I like jumping in France. Um, the French spectators are really in tune with pole vault. Um, because of Renault, um, you have a lot of knowledgeable people. And I've actually jumped a lot of my high bars in France mm-hmm. uh, myself second and third highest bars are in France um in Rouen and in um Lyon so it's it's a great place to come it does feel like a second home my mum speaks fluent French um she likes she likes Fr- France um so it does I'm very I'm I'm stoked about being there um I've had a home Olympic so you know I'm just I although it's not home crowd because they like Paul Watt so much they get a clap going and they they appre- French fans appreciate good athletics and I think that's what you were missing in places like Rio and I mean in Tokyo I didn't have a single crowd mm-hmm. so I have been very lucky in the fact I had a home Olympics but then Rio and Tokyo were a bit flat so I think Paris will be good. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about the mentoring program you're a part of? Yeah so um, I think for me I'm athletes I spoke to coaches I spoke to peer-to-peer networks and mentoring is something that I'm really important I find really important um I had a few loose mentors who were athletes uh, as a kid um Helen Clitheroe and Jenny Meadows who kind of took me under their wing they would always share with me at, at the Europeans or the worlds and stuff like that and they kind of were the athletes that I just sat and listened to so I think it's really important to that younger athletes have the option to talk to people who have been there and done that and had a lot of experience so wherever possible um, an athlete mentor is really important and I always I always offer that um, whether it's a young pole vaulter or um, just a young athlete I'm here if they want to get a coffee but we were doing um, a bit of a mentoring um, program with um, it's called YTP over here which is it was a group of 10 of us who would do calls kind of like this live talk about different topics to younger athletes who were like 15 and 16 um, and they would learn so much from that so being a mentor is is very important to me what is the most common question they ask you um I think a lot of a lot of questions on nutrition Mm -hmm. um a lot of athletes get mixed messaging as to like should I eat all the like meals with every with loads of carbs um should I be having protein shakes should I be taking supplements there's lots of ones on nutrition and then a lot of questions on you know coming back from injuries how do you stay positive how do you not get bogged down and and I think those are the two main topics really that a younger athlete struggle with Mm -hmm. um I want to respect your time so I only have a few questions left one is a bit random but do you still make your own granola bars yes um yeah I think for me it's important to have because I'm very not like strict on my diet, but I have three three square meals a day, don't like to snack. But for me, there's been a couple of occasions where because some of the meals I have are lower carbs because, you know, I'm not an endurance athlete, I'm a pole vaulter. So some meals, you know, I don't need as many carbs as, as other athletes. But sometimes in the middle of a session, especially a pole vault session that can go on for like a good few hours, I feel like not necessarily like my body, but my mind needs like a bit of sugar, a bit of a hit. So for me, having like granola balls or granola granola bars in my bag is like an emergency or really important. And I'm very, I like cooking and I like to know what's gone into my food. I'll never buy bought sauces. So for me, making my own granola balls and things like that, I know exactly how much, you know, honey and peanut butter has gone in there. And it just means that I can 
nullify for any additional sugar or anything like that so yeah for me that's really important mm. would you share the recipe maybe if i can yeah, put it in the show definitely. notes yeah yeah, yeah I'll and uh what is your go-to coffee order because i know you love coffee yeah so my go-to is either a long black or a flat white so th and that just very much depends on like if i if i go to a coffee shop where i know the coffee's really nice then i'll get a milky flat white coffee whereas if it's like a costa or somewhere that's not quite as good i'll get like a black coffee because it like a, a black coffee can hide more things mm -hmm. it, if it's burnt then getting a black coffee is better than a burnt milky coffee do you miss good coffee when traveling on the circuit Yes, very much so. I'm I'm quite good at sniffing it out. So wherever I go, I'll research for at least a week before where's the good coffee. <laughs> But if there isn't any, then I tend to just take my own. Like I do like a filter coffee um, and just get really nice beans. So that's 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 good. But there's nothing like going to a nice coffee shop, getting good latte art and a really like silky smooth coffee. Mm -hmm. So my final question to you, this podcast is called Athlete Mondial, which is French for Athletes of the World. Because what I love the most about track and field is that it is a truly universal sport. So my question to you is, what do you love the most about track and field? I think the thing I love most about track and field is its diversity for everyone. Um, you can be short, you can be tall, you can be fast, you can be slow, you can enjoy throwing the shot put, you can enjoy flinging yourself over a bar, whatever you like, there is an event for you. And not every, I mean, no other sport does that. Um, so I think it just caters for every single person out there, which is why I think it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for your time. Is there anything you want to add? No, that was great. Thank you. And that's a wrap. I'd like to thank Holly for her time and thank you all for listening. If you'd like to try it, you'll find Holly's granola bowl recipe in the show notes. Please tell your friends about the podcast if you like the episodes. And if you'd like to support the podcast, please check the links in the description. That's it for today. I'll be back soon with another episode. Bye.